Amen. I want to invite you to turn to Genesis chapter 39. Genesis chapter 39. As we continue this teaching series titled uh, Joseph. Genesis chapter 39. I'd like to start in chapter 37, though, as, as you're looking to 39, just a little bit of context. I think context is absolutely important. Context is, is king. And so some context in chapter 37. We see in verse 2 that Joseph is 17 years old when he begins to have these dreams from the Lord. And the first dream is that his brothers will bow down before him. The second dream, his brothers and his father and mother will bow down before him. All the family thinks he's absolutely crazy. Uh, there's no way that he is going to have uh, rule and reign over them. And uh, to make matters worse, Jacob gives Joseph this coat of many colors, this robe of many colors. He doesn't have one prepared for all the sons, just Joseph. There's already division. There's already tension within the family. There's already favoritism. And so... Jacob sends the sons to Shechem, which is about 60 miles north of where they're living, to pasture the flock. It's higher, it's greener, and uh, he wants to know how the sons are doing in a report, so he sends Joseph. So Joseph goes to check on his brothers in Shechem. He gets there and is told that they're not there, that they're in Dothan, about 10 miles north of Shechem. They've moved the, the pasture, the flocks in Dothan, and so that's where they're at. They're in Dothan, and what we see in chapter 37 is as Joseph with his coat is uh, in the distance, off in the distance, approaching his brothers, they begin to form a plan. Now, think about this just for a moment. How much envy, how much jealousy, how much hatred must have been in them to conspire this plan to kill their brother, Joseph. I would always challenge us to check our hearts to make sure that none of those things live within us. The enemy would love for envy and jealousy and hatred to, to grow within you. Why? Because it begins to consume you. And it's reached a point where it's totally consumed the brothers. And so they take him. They form this plan. They rip the robe off of him. Judah steps in. We looked at the life of Judah in chapter 38 last week. Judah and Tamar. Judah steps in and, and says, what do we gain if we kill our brother? Remember the story, chapter 37. Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites. At this point, he's being held in a pit, in a cistern, used to hold water. And that's where... Joseph finds himself. These Ishmaelites are making their approach to Egypt. Dothan was a well-known caravan route. And so they're making their approach to Egypt. And so they sell, the brothers sell Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. As I said a couple weeks ago, 20 pieces of silver was the price of a handicapped slave. That's the price that they valued their brother Joseph. So they sell Joseph to the Ishmaelites. They make their way down to Egypt. Chapter 37 closes where chapter 39 begins. But consider Joseph in his age of 17 years old. I mean, you think back to where you were at 17 years old. I, I know for some it might, you know, have to think a little harder, but that's okay. We're with you. But you, you, think, about, you think about that age of, that, that younger age and, there's something about God calling people at a young age. There's something about it. Something about being young. There's something about being receptive. There's something about being impressionable. And, and so we see that very much, this faith being developed in Joseph's age, uh, in Joseph's life at a young age. And as we look through the rest of the Bible, we often see God calling people at a young age. And that's why we pray for babies like Knox. In, in the 9 a.m., it was Finley. And, and we, 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 we value 
the younger generation. We put so much value in the younger generation to preach and teach the gospel of Jesus at this young age. But, but we see this throughout the Bible. We see Samuel, his parents taking Samuel to the temple, dedicating him to the Lord at a, at a young age. We see uh, with David, young shepherd boy, not king yet, uh, but young shepherd boy willing to go before Goliath when the rest of the army, they, they were off in the distance hiding. They were in hiding from Goliath and the Philistines. But young shepherd boy David couldn't even wear the king's armor. He says, no, I'll go. And I'll go by the might of the Lord. Young shepherd boy David knew whom his Lord was. We see this in the life of Daniel. As Daniel was taken as a, as a teen, he was taken into captivity and moved to, away, shipped off to, to Babylon. And we see it in the, the story of Daniel, how he would not bow before the king because he knew whom his God was. We see this in the life of Mary. God calling Mary at a young age to bear the, the, the savior of the world within her womb. What a precious and great responsibility that the Messiah of the world would come through a young teen in Mary. We see this God calling a, a younger generation in Timothy and how Paul disciples Timothy. He sees the potential in Timothy and he calls him to come and to plant these churches. And as a result, Europe is evangelized at a young age. Paul says this to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. Don't let anyone despise your youth, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Paul encourages Timothy to not let people look down on you, but hold on to your confession of, of faith. I'm so thankful for what God is doing in the life of Discovery Church. I'm so thankful for how God is moving in our family ministry, in our Discovery Kids ministry, and in our youth ministry. This past Wednesday, we meet every Wednesday at 8.30 in the lobby, and anyone that is available is encouraged to come and pray. And we simply pray. It's not a Bible study hour. It's certainly not a gossip hour. It is a, it's a time to pray. We take the needs of the church before the Lord. And uh, we pray. And this past Wednesday, as we're praying, we already know the weather uh, was very windy. It was going to be very rainy. It was going to be a mess. Praise God, it's over. And for five minutes yesterday, there was cool weather. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I, I, I attempted to wear the long sleeve just to continue it on. It is fall. And, um, and so we're praying and we, we, Pastor Mike and his youth team had this thing planned, this pumpkin Olympics, pumpkin something or other. They're going to throw pumpkins at each other. It's going to be a great night. Somehow the gospel is going to be preached through it. I don't know. Uh, and uh, I trust them. And so they begin to pray. And as they're praying, I start hearing Pastor Mike. I hear Asa. I hear Ben. They're all praying. And God, you're changing what we had the plan for. And God, would you, would you do a special work tonight despite the weather? As the day prolonged, it, it's easy to start thinking, well, no one's going to show up because of the weather, Right. <laughs> Typically, that's the, that's the worst thought. Oh, the weather's going to hold, hold people back. But people started coming. You started coming. And I uh, came to pick up my girls from, from Discovery Kids. Uh, and, uh, and I saw Pastor Mike. His face was lit up. He was, he was amped up. And he said, man, you never believe what God did tonight. I said, what did God do? And he said, five youth surrendered their lives over to Jesus tonight. Five And here's the beauty of it all. They had this other plan, but praise be to God that he had a greater plan. And I'm so thankful to be a part of a church that is pouring into the younger generation. And I'm so thankful to be a part of a church where the older generation is committing to come alongside of the younger generation. And by the way, if the Lord is moving in your heart, moving in your life, and you're wondering, could God use me 
The answer is yes, without a thought. Yes, God can use you. See, Pastor Mike, if the Lord is leading you in the way of raising up the younger generation, teaching the younger, younger generation. Joseph, 17 years old, he finds himself away from his father. I would, I would say family, but we know what the family thinks of him, at least the brothers. He's away from his father and he's in Egypt. He's been sold to the Ishmaelites. And now he's sold to the second time to Potiphar. Look at chapter 39, verse 1 now. Joseph had been taken to Egypt. An Egyptian named Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and the captain of the guards, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him there. And so Joseph is sold to Potiphar. We know Potiphar is a, a man of position. He's a man of uh, responsibility. People look up to him. He's a man of power. He's a captain of the guards. And Joseph has been sold into his house. All along, the Lord is developing Joseph's faith. And that's the beauty of the circumstances that we find ourselves in. That if we'll allow God, he will develop our faith. He will grow our faith. You think, you, you often look, we look at the challenges before us or the mountains before us or the circumstances surrounding us. And we often wonder, God, what are you doing? Why am I here? What is going on? Rather than looking through it all, keeping our eyes on him and knowing that he is at work. And I want to encourage you today. I don't know what circumstance might be surrounding you today, but God is at work. God is, is good. Even though your circumstance might not appear good, God is, is good. Even though you might question, God, are you still faithful? Listen to me today. He is still faithful. And the question is, will we trust him? Will we, will we trust him? See, Joseph believed God despite the circumstances, despite his circumstances. You say, well, show me. Well, we're going to see that in verse two. He believed God despite his circumstances. The Lord is developing Joseph's faith. And again, the Lord often uses the painful moments of our lives to grow us up in the faith. Look at verse two. The Lord was with Joseph. And he became a successful man serving in the household of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made everything he did successful. Do you see this? How could anyone be a success when they're sold into slavery? There's a distant gap between him and his family. He's experienced loss and tragedy. But what do we see? The Lord was with Joseph. What an encouragement to us today. No matter where we find ourselves or what we're looking at, or what's surrounding us, be encouraged. Those who are in Christ Jesus, the Lord is with you. And what else do you need? The answer is really nothing. <laughs> Apart from God and his grace and his mercy and his strength and his goodness, and his joy. We see that the Lord was with Joseph. He became a success. Even in the midst of the circumstance, he becomes a success. N notice this in verse three. When his master saw that there was a great testimony about Joseph, the master saw something in, in him. The master observed something in, in Joseph. Joseph is successful. He is a great testimony. And whatever Joseph touches, Scripture tells us the Lord blesses. Can this be said of you? Joseph is determined to be faithful and to be a testimony for God's glory. Joseph is determined, and we're going to see this as Potiphar's wife makes these advances. He is determined to be faithful and to be a testimony for God's glory. Look at verse four. Joseph found favor with his master 
and became his personal attendant. Potiphar also put him in charge of his household and placed all that he owned under his authority. From the time that he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house because of Joseph. The Lord's blessing was on all that he owned in his house and in all his fields. He left all that he owned under Joseph's authority. He did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now, Joseph was well built and and handsome. And so the Lord blessed Potiphar's home, an Egyptian's home, someone that, that worshiped other false gods, practiced pagan worship. Somehow God blessed this home. Why? Because of Joseph. Potiphar totally trusted Joseph. And I wonder, can this be said of us? People in our lives that are observing our lives, can we be trusted? Can we be trusted? Listen, God can bless you right where you are. Don't wait. For a better situation to be blessed by God. It would have been a tragedy had Joseph had Joseph not lived out his faith, had Joseph not been a testimony of God's goodness, had Joseph not been faithful. But but the word tells us that he is faithful, despite his circumstance. Uh, so many are so and uh, with where they find that they miss the opportunity to live for the glory of God. And I want to encourage us today with his help and his grace and his kindness towards us. Be faithful where God has you. And in his time, trust him to move you. But until he moves you, be faithful. Be faithful. We see that uh, Joseph is well-built and handsome. Really no further explanation needed there. Magazine, GQ kind of magazine, picturesque here. Catches the attention of Potiphar's wife. Joseph also raises the interest of the evil one. And, uh, And I want you to know today, that the enemy, he, he has studied you. And the enemy knows your strengths and he knows your weaknesses. And the enemy waits for the opportunity to take you down. How do I know this? We're going to see it in the life of Joseph coming up next. But, but we also see in 1 Peter chapter 5. Would you write that text down? 1 Peter chapter 5. Verse 6 says, humble yourselves. What a reminder for the church, for you and I. Lord, clothe me in humility. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God so that he may exalt you at the proper time. Humble yourselves. Verse 7, casting all your cares on him because he cares about you. What an encouragement today. No matter where you find yourself, the circumstances surrounding the lack, the wants, Would you surrender it over to him? Because he cares deeply for you. Look at verse 8. Be sober-minded. Be sober-minded. Be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for anyone he can devour. The enemy is active at work. The enemy wants to take you out. The enemy wants to cause utter destruction. He's like a thief who's come to steal, kill, and destroy. But note what Jesus says in John 10, 10 in response. I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly. We have to know that the enemy, we have to know that he is at work. And as we continue to remain faithful, know that he is fighting against our faithfulness. He's like a roaring lion. He's prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. Look at verse 9. Here's what we do. Resist him. Resist him. 
Firm in the faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world. The God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, establish, strengthen, and support you after you have suffered a little while. To him be dominion forever. Amen. What do we do in response to the evil one who is prowling around, seeking whom he might devour? We're called to resist him. We're called to resist him. And this is what we're going to see Joseph practice. Resist, refuse the evil one. Look at verse 8 of Genesis 39. But he refused. Verse 7, after some time, his master's wife looked longingly at Joseph and said, sleep with me. She didn't mix her words. Uh, she was straight up. It's what I want. I see you. I'm watching you. Sleep with me. Verse 8, but he refused. But he refused. He resisted. Look, he said to his master's wife, with me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in his house. And he has put all that he owns under my authority. No one in this house is greater than I am. He has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. Listen to this. So how could I do this immense evil? And how could I sin against God? Although she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused, he refused to go to bed with her. You see, there's two advances Two responses to the advances, rather. Joseph refuses her advances. Would you write this down with, with ethical conviction? Ethical conviction. What is this? There's a certain standard as we look to the word of God that we're to carry our lives, live our lives, to be known. There's an ethical conviction should should have within us. And Joseph refuses. He says this, how can I do this immense evil? How could I do this immense evil? Joseph refused her advances with ethical conviction. He, he tells her, I've been entrusted with all of this. I have an integrity and there's a, there's a character. Joseph refused her advances with ethical conviction. I wonder, are you known for your ethical convictions. When a co-worker thinks of you, do they think of the, the person that cuts the corners or, or cheats just a little bit or doesn't share all the truth? I, I pray not. I pray that we would be different, that we would be set apart, that we would be known as we look to the standard of the word of God to be men and women that bring glory and honor to his name. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13 says, To fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate arrogant pride, evil conduct, and perverse speech. We see this is so, so counterculture, right? Counterculture to the world. But, but this is the standard for our lives, for the church. To, to run from these things, to refuse these things, to resist these things. The second, we see that Joseph refused her advances with spiritual devotion. Would you write that down? Spiritual devotion. So first is ethical conviction. The second is a spiritual devotion. What does that mean? That means that Joseph had such an awareness of who God was. This is the same God that rescued me. As my brothers were ripping this robe off and we don't know all the details that they were sharing with anger. This is the same God that was with me then. This is the same God that was with me when they, when they threw me in the pit. And I thought my life was over. And then I was lifted up out of that pit. This is the same God that was with me. I was sold into to the Ishmaelites in slavery. This is the same God that was with me all the way down on this journey to Egypt. This is the same God that was with me when I was sold to Potiphar's house. It's the same God that was with me. I, I wonder... Do you have the same awesome awareness of who God is? I pray that it's developing within us. I pray that 
we would be people that wake up each day and give God all the glory and say, God, it's you who goes before me. It's in you that I live, move, and exist and have my being. I pray that that would be our response. Each day that God gives us life is another opportunity to bring him glory, to testify of his goodness. Joseph refused her advances with spiritual devotion. Are you known for your spiritual devotion? Psalmist says in Psalm 34, I sought the Lord and he answered me and rescued me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant with joy. Their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him from all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. Verse eight, taste and see that the Lord is good. How happy is the person who takes refuge in him? I wonder, have you tasted, tasted and seen that the Lord he is good. She continues, Potiphar's wife continues to pursue him and Joseph continues to resist. We see in verse, we see this in verse 11 and, and then if you look down to verse 16, she put Joseph's garment beside her until his master came home. Then she told, verse 17, then she told him the same story. The Hebrew slave you brought to us came to make a fool of me. But when I screamed for help, he left his garment beside me and ran outside. So Potiphar's wife, what does she do? She doesn't get her way. She doesn't get, get her want. Joseph refuses her. And so she forms this plan. She forms this lie. You see, the response of the master, verse 19, when his master heard the story, his wife told him, these are the things your slave did to me. He was furious. He was furious and had him thrown in a prison where the king's prisoners confined. So Joseph was there in prison. Joseph was there in prison. Joseph's thrown in prison. Why? Because of a lie. Joseph's thrown in prison because he was doing the very thing that honored the Lord. And again, often we, we think about our lives and we think about the circumstances around us. And if we're honest, there's this selfish desire for more rather than just being content with honoring the Lord where we're at. And no matter what happens, Joseph's is thrown in prison for doing the right thing. Verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph. Do you see it again? And extended kindness to him. He granted him favor with the prison warden. The warden put all the prisoners who were in the prison under Joseph's authority. And he was responsible for everything that was done there. The warden did not bother with anything under Joseph's authority. Why? Because the Lord was with him. And the Lord made everything that he did successful. The very same thing takes place in the prison. The Lord was with Joseph. Hey, look, I don't know where you find yourself today. I don't know. I don't know if it's in a pit. I don't know if it's in some kind of Potiphar's house. <laughs> I don't know if it's in a prison. But I want you to hear me today. Those that are in Christ Jesus, the Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. David said it's Psalm 23, a familiar text. The Lord is my shepherd. He had an awesome awareness of who the Lord was. He says, I have what I need. Verse two, he lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right path for his name's sake. Even when I go through the darkest valley, listen closely. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger. Why? For you are with me. 
for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Listen, I, I don't know what valley you might be walking through or, or what valley is just ahead. What valley is just ahead? And I know this. The one we serve is with us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Paul said, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the church in Rome, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Some of you need to hear that. Some of you need to believe it today. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes all across this place, those online with us, I encourage you to take a moment to take a moment and thank God for his presence would you thank him it's easy to go through life and certain days think uh, we got this there's not a moment that we got apart from him. We need him every moment of every day. And so would you just, would you just tell him, thank you, God, that you are present. I wonder what your response is today. I wonder where you find yourself today. I wonder what circumstances might be surrounding you. wonder what the great challenges that you're facing are. In this posture of prayer, would you just surrender them over to the Lord? Lord, I humble myself. I surrender them to you. Surrender them to you. As people are praying all across this place and those aligned with this, I wonder if there's someone here that's never surrendered your life over to Jesus. What does that mean? It means you go from death to life. You go from no hope to a living hope, an eternal one in heaven one day. What does that mean? You go from not knowing mercy to it's all about his mercy each day. It, it, it goes from trying to work my way into heaven to trusting him, and his righteousness, and his finished work. And I wonder today if there's someone here it's never surrendered over to the Lord Jesus as Savior. And that today might be the day of salvation. Whether you're in the house, you're online with us. If that's you, as people are praying all across this place, I wonder if that's you. And if that is you, something stirring within you, right where you're at, would you, would you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord? Jesus, you are Lord, your boss, your master. I trust you. I believe in you. From your mouth, Jesus, you walked this earth and you died on a cross. You were placed in a grave. You rose victorious for me. I am a sinner and you are the Savior. Take my life. Use me for your glory all the days of my life. Thank you for saving me. If that's your prayer, would you thank him for saving you? In just a moment as we sing this song, there's going to be men and women at the different corners of this room. There's someone online. To, we would love to pray with you. Whatever you're facing, whatever circumstance, whatever challenge, men with men, women with women, we would love to, to pray with you. But before we sing this song, I, I just wonder, there's someone here today that you find yourself in a circumstances are just surrounding and 
you needed just to hear today this reminder that the Lord is with you. If that's you, would you just have the courage just to stand? I'm going to pray for you. Would you have the courage just to stand? Amen. Amen. The Lord is with me. Need to hear that today. Anybody else? Anyone else saying, the Lord is is with me. Father, I pray for those that are standing today. Father, you know the circumstances surrounding them. You know the great loss. Lord, I pray that they would taste and see today that you are good. I pray that they would experience your unconditional love in a very special, very real way today. Lord, would you take your loving arms and embrace them? Thank you for this truth. You are with us. As you are with Joseph, you are with us today. And so we praise you. We praise you. We honor you.